Welcome to this session on the metabolic myopathies. In previous classes, as far back as undergraduate studies, or even high school, you have probably discussed at length about the metabolic or energy pathways that allow for the rapid breakdown of the energy nutrients, namely carbohydrate, fat, and protein, to produce cellular energy. These pathways involve a number of metabolic steps and require a number of enzymes to complete the breakdown. So what happens if one of these enzymes wasn't functionally properly? As you might expect, the effects are going to be highly dependent on the pathway affected and the specific step along the way. And as a highly metabolic tissue, these enzyme deficiencies are going to have a particular effect on muscle tissue. The metabolic myopathies are therefore muscle diseases that result from inborn errors of metabolism. In the upcoming sessions, we'll group these disorders as either errors of glucose metabolism, lipid metabolism, or as errors within the tricarboxylic acid or electron transport chain, which are collectively called the mitochondrial myopathies. In the first segment, however, we will start with a review of the metabolic pathways and how each is called upon during fasting and exercise, which will have important implications in patient presentation, in clinical testing, in making a differential diagnosis. Let's start with the most simplistic of energy pathways, glycolysis. This is a process by which sugar moieties are broken down into the three-carbon pyruvate molecule. In the preparatory phase, energy is consumed to prime the moiety to be split into two three-carbon sugars. In the payoff phase, the three-carbon sugars are oxidized to pyruvate, and ATP is generated in the process. In addition, two molecules of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide are reduced and travel to the mitochondria to contribute the hydrogen and electrons acquired from the oxidation of glucose to the electron transport chain. The most common source of sugar are glucose molecules, although other sugars, such as fructose, can also enter into the pathway. In periods immediately following a meal, cells can pull glucose from circulation for glycolysis. Sugar imported into the cell that is not immediately used for energy needs can be converted to a storage form called glycogen. This provides a source of energy in the post-absorptive phase when blood glucose levels start to decrease. Whether stored or hydrolyzed, the first step in the process is conversion into glucose 6-phosphate, which locks the molecule into the cell. Only the liver, which contains the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase, can later regenerate free glucose for exocytosis to replenish depleted blood glucose stores. Following glycolysis, pyruvate can take one of two metabolic pathways. The preferred path is for transport of pyruvate into the mitochondrial matrix, where it can be converted into acetyl-CoA with reduction of another NAD molecule into NADH and the production of carbon dioxide. This is the typical path under aerobic conditions when there is sufficient oxygen available to accept electrons and regenerate the oxidized form of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Under conditions of increased energy demands for the cell, the alternative pathway in which pyruvate is converted into lactic acid becomes increasingly important. A second pathway for cellular respiration is beta oxidation. This is the process by which the fatty acid chains making up triglycerides are broken down and metabolized for energy. The process of beta oxidation occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, so for any of this to take place, the fatty acid chain must first pass through the mitochondrial membranes. While short chain fatty acids can diffuse across the mitochondrial membranes, Long chain fatty acids with more than 14 hydrocarbons depend on the carnitine shuttle system to access the matrix. The first step in this process involves the transfer of a coenzyme A group to the carboxyl end of the chain to form a fatty acyl CoA moiety. This is catalyzed through acyl CoA synthetase enzymes found at the outer mitochondrial membrane. In the next step, the acyl-CoA group is further combined with a carnitine group to form a fatty acyl carnitine compound. This transesterification reaction is catalyzed by a carnitine pomitoyl transferase enzyme associated with the inner mitochondrial membrane, 
designated as CPT1. This acyl carnitine group is recognized by the carnitine translocase protein found within the inner mitochondrial membrane, which pulls it into the mitochondrial matrix in exchange for free carnitine within the matrix. Once inside the matrix, a second carnitine acyl transferase enzyme, CPT2, reverses the esterification between carnitine and fatty acyl-CoA. The free carnitine group is now free to translocate through the inner mitochondrial membrane through the translocase antiporter to bind with additional fatty acyl-CoA for further transport of fatty acids into the mitochondria. Once inside the mitochondrial matrix, fatty acids undergo beta oxidation between the second and third carbons in the chain. Acetyl-CoA is liberated from the chain through substitution when a second CoA binds to the third carbon in the chain. This becomes the new terminal carbon in the chain, allowing for additional oxidation between the new second and third carbon in the shortened chain. The cycle repeats until the chain is consumed, with each cycle generating a molecule of acetyl-CoA and reduced forms of both nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide as well as flavin adenine dinucleotide. Acetyl-CoA therefore serves as a common intermediate for both glycolysis and beta oxidation and the point at which the two paths converge. The next phase in cellular respiration is the citric acid cycle. The cycle begins when the 4-carbon oxaloacetate intermediate displaces coenzyme A, fusing with the 2-carbon acetyl group to form the 6-carbon citrate. As the cycle progresses, the two hydrocarbons on the end opposite to where the acetyl group joined are progressively oxidized and displaced. Ultimately, oxaloacetate is reformed and can combine with another acetyl group to restart the cycle. The acetyl group from the previous round of the cycle now represent the intermediate carbons of the chain, and they will be the carbons reduced and released as carbon dioxide with the next cycle. Each turn of the cycle generates two molecules of carbon dioxide, one molecule of ATP, and reduces three molecules of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. The final step in cellular respiration is the electron transport chain. In this stage, a series of inner mitochondrial transmembrane proteins serve as electron acceptors, regenerating the oxidized forms of nicotinamide and flavin adenine dinucleotide, which can again reduce intermediates in glycolysis, beta oxidation, and Krebs cycle. Many of these proteins also serve as proton pumps and utilize the energy from electron transfer to actively transport protons against their concentration gradient from the mitochondrial matrix to the inner membrane space. The return of protons to the matrix through the ATP synthase protein generates the energy necessary for this enzyme to reform ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. The electrons are ultimately accepted by oxygen delivered to the cell through the cardiorespiratory system to form water. Under resting physiological conditions in a healthy individual, the amount of oxygen delivered to the cells through the body is sufficient to meet the energy demands of the cell, and cellular respiration proceeds normally, according to the nutrients available to the cell. With physical movement, ATP consumption in active muscle tissue increases, which in turn increases the oxygen demand for the cell. For light activity and some maximal exercise, such as walking and jogging, the body can increase oxygen supply by increasing circulation to active muscle. This is sometimes referred to as steady state exercise, where oxygen supply equally balances energy demands. There is typically a slight lag in this increase in circulation and oxygen delivery, in which energy demands exceed oxygen supply. During this phase, cells typically rely on an auxiliary energy supply, sometimes referred to as the immediate early energy system. This involves an additional energy molecule known as creatine phosphate. During the first few seconds of activity, creatine phosphate donates its phosphate group to ADP to rapidly regenerate ATP for further muscle contraction. Although there is an abundant amount of creatine phosphate within the muscle cytosol, it can be rapidly depleted within a matter of a few seconds. 
the D-phosphorylated creatine must then travel to mitochondria, where ATP regenerates the phosphorylated form for the next time it is needed. Within the first 20 seconds of submaximal activity, oxygen supply has increased to balance energy demands and the body has reached what is known as steady state exercise. For the first 20 minutes of exercise, the body typically relies most heavily on glycolysis to generate the acetyl-CoA that feeds into the citric acid cycle, consuming both blood glucose delivered to the cell and glucose derived from the breakdown of glycogen stores within the cell. As activity continues, the concentrations of glucose begin to diminish, and the body transitions to the breakdown of triglycerides to generate ATP through beta-oxidation. It's highly dependent on the physical condition of the individual, concentration of nutrients present, and the intensity of exercise, but at some point around 20 minutes into the activity, beta-oxidation surpasses glycolysis as the principal source of acetyl-CoA production. This continues until the end of activity, when energy demands return to normal. In cases of maximal exertion, such as sprinting, the energy demands of the muscle cells exceed the maximal amount of oxygen that the body can supply. Because oxygen serves as the terminal electron acceptor, there is a maximal rate at which electrons can flow through the electron transport chain, which means a maximal rate at which nicotinamide and flavin adenine dinucleotide can be oxidized. This would also mean a maximal rate for the citric acid cycle, which requires the reduction of these compounds to proceed. If the energy demands of the cell exceed the supply of oxygen, some of the pyruvate generated during glycolysis can be reduced to lactate by accepting electrons from NADH. The oxidized nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide can be utilized in glycolysis to generate even more pyruvate. In essence, this allows the rate of glycolysis to increase independently of oxygen availability, a condition sometimes referred to as anaerobic glycolysis. The lactate that is generated enters the bloodstream as lactic acid. As lactic acid accumulates, it lowers the blood pH and results in a burning sensation known as lactic acidosis. This process continues to a point where the acidity in the tissue surrounding the muscle compromises function, or the individual voluntarily reduces activity to a level below the aerobic threshold due to pain and fatigue. Activities with energy consumption above this threshold are never able to achieve a steady state and will not be able to continue for a prolonged period of time. Regardless of the intensity, there is a period following the termination of activity where oxygen consumption remains elevated above the resting energy demands of the cell. This is referred to as excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, or EPOC for short. This is the cell's opportunity to recover from the energy debt that was generated during the activity. Remember, in the initial phase of activity, creatine phosphate stores were depleted to make up for the delayed rise in oxygen supply. This is the point at which creatine phosphate is aerobically regenerated. Any lactic acid that was generated during the activity is also taken up by the muscle tissue and oxidized back to pyruvate. It can then be converted to acetyl-CoA to enter the citric acid cycle or be converted back to glycogen through gluconeogenesis. The utilization of energy seen during steady-state exercise is similar to what is observed under fasted conditions. Following a meal, cells are able to readily absorb circulating blood glucose for both storage and energy utilization. Fat is typically absorbed into adipocytes for use at a later period of time. During the post-absorptive phase, blood glucose levels begin to decrease, similar to what is seen during prolonged activity. The body senses this decline and gradually transitions to fat as an increasingly important fuel source. This is done in order to conserve glucose for neural tissue, which is unable to metabolize fat. If fasting continues beyond hours into days, the body will begin to catabolize protein sources, generating ketone bodies as an alternative fuel source for brain tissue. This is far from an ideal situation as protein is primarily used as a building material, and ketone bodies are toxic for the body. 
During periods of starvation, individuals appear lethargic and disoriented due to dangerously low blood sugar and present with a characteristic smell of rotting fruit on their breath due to the presence of ketone bodies within the blood. One final topic to introduce in this segment, which plays a prominent role in many of the metabolic myopathies, is rhabdomyolysis. A complication seen with a number of the metabolic myopathies is metabolic crisis, in which energy deficiencies and metabolite buildup can result in dramatic and widespread muscle damage and the leakage of intracellular contents into the blood. We previously discussed creatine kinase enzyme as an indicator of muscle damage, but there is also the release of myoglobin, an oxygen-binding protein, into the blood. In smaller amounts, blood myoglobin is not a significant issue, but in larger quantities, it has the potential to interfere with tissues throughout the body. In particular, elevated serum myoglobin disrupts the filtration apparatus for the kidneys, which can result in widespread kidney damage. Signs of clinically significant muscle damage, termed rhabdomyolysis, include pain and swelling in skeletal muscle groups and discolored urine. A patient with a diagnosed metabolic myopathy should be carefully observed for signs of rhabdomyolysis and quickly treated with aggressive IV fluid replacement to stave off kidney damage and other complications related to rhabdomyolysis. That concludes this brief review of energy metabolism and cellular respiration. In the next segment, we will consider a group of diseases related to the metabolism of glucose for energy production. These are the glycogen storage diseases.